it was great to hear from both you and Courtney today on such a variety of issues related to communicating and uh, I love this word change making um, around climate change. And I think what what um, we can do now, we don't have tons of time, but we definitely have 15 minutes, which will give us some time to respond to some of the questions that have been asked in the chat box. Um, what I'd like to ask is if you have any further questions, please post them now, and then we can see how many we get to. And if there's any similar questions, we'll try and kind of amalgamate them. Um, thanks so much, Alan. That was great. I'm wondering if um, if we still have Courtney there on the line. If not, um, hopefully she'll come back. And if not, yes, Ellen, I'm here, and I have managed to unmute my phone without disconnecting. Oh, my perfect. Time. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Courtney. Um, so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read these two questions out, and um, either you or Helen can can go for answering them, um, depending on who sort of wants to first. Um, the first question that I see here is from Cornell Lenkar, who asks, is there evidence that public input influences political decision? Um, and then she notes that the promise to change electoral system was not kept while it's known that smoking restrictions and institutions were introduced only after decision makers and executives came on board. Um, I'm wondering if either of you want to respond to that, Courtney or Helen. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, as you know, a lot of um, initiatives in the federal government or other parts of the government have a public consultation process. And so, for instance, you know, in the making of the food guide, I wrote a couple big submissions on behalf of CAPE, and those went into the official process. And the products of that process, and there were roundtables, et cetera, um, ended up generating a really evidence-based food guide. But the thing that was key to that process was that Jane Philpott was the Minister of Health, and by all accounts, she essentially put her elbows up and said, look, we are not going to have closed door meetings uh, with food industry lobbyists over the course of this uh, consultation. And she held the line despite tremendous pressure. Um, you know, the lobbyists were trying to lobby other ministers uh, to put pressure on her and she, she didn't. And so I think that there's, you know, formal processes and informal um, ways that uh, politicians interact with those processes and there's I suspect there's no science to it and it uh, is one of those uh, things where a lot of it has to do with personality but uh, you know many of you know that I uh, ran for the leadership of the federal Green Party this last spring and what I learned from that was that nobody really cares um, if you have an evidence-based message really um, I put a lot of effort into uh, trying to bridge the what seems sometimes like a divide um, between academia and politics that uh, we had. We ran a 12-week change-making series with nonpartisan experts, um, and really, I think we had we, we did have some of Canada's and the world's top academics, and we tried to make a space that was very comfortable. Um, I published three <laughs> three um, articles in high-ranking journals that were relevant to the subject matter. Got no media for them whatsoever, um, and what what really important to know is that all of that work uh, represented an opportunity cost for me in terms of generating funds, um, which is really one of the metrics that you're evaluated by. So when you, when you want to influence politicians, be really, really conscious that their main metrics of evaluation are fundraising numbers and votes. So I think that if you can manage to do um, any kind of uh, consultation process in a way that sways public opinion enough that it puts votes and fundraising um, at risk or influences them, that's when you're really going to have a uh, an impact because really it's a very, very busy life. Like being a doctor is a busy life, but I think politicians are actually busier. You have minus time, like zero time. And so it's not that I think people don't care about the evidence. It's just that their job is to get their job, and getting their job requires them to fundraise a ton of money and get a bunch of votes. And there isn't always a ton of time to be reading evidence-based documents. So I hope that I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Courtney. Um, I certainly think it's a better answer than I could have given to that one. Um, so thank you very much. Hopefully, hopefully, um, sorry, I'm looking for who asked it. 
hopefully the person who asked it um, feels the same. Maybe you can post in the chat box. Um, we have another question here, uh, and I think this one's more for Helen. Um, and this is about the uh, potential next phase for the uh, Make It Better campaign. It's, it's about whether or not there are plans to integrate mental health um, into the messaging. Helen, I don't know if you can comment on that. Yeah, d definitely. So, well, we're, we're looking to fundraise because, like I mentioned, this like OPHA, the Ontario Public Health Association, is a not-for-profit organization. So everything they organize, and I'm a volunteer, so I'm doing this on volunteer time. Um, but um, yeah, definitely. And we did. There is some messaging in there, and I don't know if I have the statistic in front of me, but it's quite startling. So I did a lot of the the health research, and and there's lots of facts on our website. But one component was mental health and um, climate change link. And um, the one fact, and I think it, it went with that um, the social media message about the, the little boy holding his mom's hand, and it looks like it might have been a disaster or something. But the, I think the statistic is that the, the, psycho, the psychosocial impacts of a disaster um, are 40 times as much as the, the other, like I guess the physiological impact of a disaster. So, yeah, and there was a great presentation yesterday about the psychosocial impacts of um, COVID, but similarly for disasters that, and especially not just the disasters that are happening over and over again, but the fear, as Courtney had pointed out, like what future child born today has. So, yeah, we uh, talk about the incidence of, of, of mental health or hospitalizations for children um, for mental health reasons. and. But we also talk about active hope and, and a little bit of the research that I was doing that talks about if you can become engaged in an, an activity or, like, or part of a, a coalition or a community group, that can help address that. So certainly lots more that needs to be done there, but, but we did try to incorporate it. Thanks, Helen. Um... So, you know, you kind of got hinted at this here, but I, I would love to hear, we do have one um, more question from Angela Leroy, and I'll get to that in just a moment, but I'd love to hear from either you or Courtney on um, if you can identify any opportunities for public health units and public health actors within those units um, to engage in either campaigns like uh, the one that you've shared, Helen, or and to adapt and run their own, or to engage uh, Courtney as you've been talking about in that larger kind of movement for uh, a, a just green um, future. So uh, whether that is positioned within a COVID recovery or not. So are there are there places that um, people, actors within public health can sort of go and say, I want to be part of this, um, who should we join up with, that kind of thing. So if there's anything you know about, just to let us know here. Okay, so you, could I answer that a bit now? I know you don't have sure, a lot of time. Go for it. So for sure, like, um, it'd be great. We are at the Ontario Public Health Association Environmental Health Work Group. The, the folks on, the members of, of the committee represent health units across Ontario, and many of them are working on their climate and health vulnerability assessments right now. And when I was looking at, when we were looking at the phase two, I contacted each of them and I asked them how our campaign could help them, like especially with there's so many other priorities, if we have messaging that they could use and, and if, if they're comfortable that the, the health evidence that's there is something that they could back, then yeah, so I thought this would be an easier way for them to, to do some climate communication in their own communities. Um, but yeah, and, and also for our website, we've said to the health units, and, and we have a spokesperson, Dr. Gardner, who's the medical officer of health for Simcoe Muskoka, where, where I live. Um, he has a video on our Make It Better page, and there's, there's other um, health people that, that leave messages or have messages on our, our web page, and we have testimonials from those three um, uh, communities or the, the actions of, of hope, active hope, we have testimonials from people that were involved in those campaigns. So yes, for sure, if anyone's interested, we would love to talk to them and include their information on our website. Great, thank you. Um, thanks, Helena, that's really helpful for, for others, I'm sure to hear. Um, I'm wondering if, Courtney, if uh, you wanna respond to what I just asked in terms of opportunities to engage in that kind of bigger movement and to get involved, um, while also commenting, um, if you can, on Angela's last question there, which is 
are there key lessons learned from risk communication um, during COVID-19 that we can translate to climate change? And I imagine this is something that you've also been thinking about a little bit. Yeah. So the things that we, and I'm thinking with a pretty macro level hat on right now, I spent yesterday in a lot of calls with uh, the Global Climate and Health Alliance and the Planetary Health Alliance. And our job as a global community right now is to make sure that our nation's anti-up mitigation commitment um, for the upcoming COP in Glasgow. So Canada right now, um, our nationally determined contribution commitment that we've submitted to the Paris Agreement is really inadequate, and it's not adequate to protect the health of a child born today. So the way I think about, uh, and you know, if, if, if one of you guys could come up with a sexy name for a nationally determined contribution to the Paris Agreement, you would be doing the entire English-speaking world a great service because it's, a, it's just a brutal, brutal thing to try to sell. Um, but basically, it's just how much are we going to commit to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions? And for me, a healthy nationally determined contribution is one that is adequate to protecting the health of a child born today by keeping, doing Canada's fair share of keeping us uh, below one and a half degrees Celsius. And what's cool about them is that the way when you submit them, um, you can say, and this is, these are the measures we're going to take in order to add up to that level of greenhouse gas emission reductions. And so in our previous one, Canada talked about coal phase out, um, which has, as we know, you know, the air pollution related health benefits associated with it. And so I think the more we can be framing our work this year around that overall endeavor, so how are we going to make sure Canada delivers what we need to deliver to do our fair share at this moment of planetary health emergency in order to prevent further planetary health emergencies, um, the better. Um, the lens of planetary health is going to come out with a new issue in about, I think it's two weeks where they've evaluated the uh, health and economic benefits of various um, measures to decrease greenhouse gas uh, greenhouse gases. And so here in Canada, some of our big opportunities are around transport and electrifying our grid uh, because transport really makes up about 25% um, of our greenhouse gas emissions as well as uh, it's responsible depending on which uh, air pollution study you're looking at for at least 1,000 deaths from PM2.5 alone. And so if we can be thinking, okay, how do we make sure Canada delivers this by next fall how do we, as, as people trained in communication around co-benefits of that kind of work, really communicate the advantages to all of us right now of the measures that we're going to need to take in order to meet those commitments? I think that that will um, help focus our efforts and really, um, especially in the context of Gina McCarthy being the new climate head down in the U.S. So she actually, her last job was that she was the head of um, – climate change and health at Harvard. So she was Renee Salas' boss. So she was the person who um, basically sponsored the Lancet countdown in the U.S. And so it's absolutely incredible that Biden's new climate head is one of the most well-briefed people in the world on climate change and health, and she's now got the platform um, to take advantage of that. So how can we in Canada encourage similar work here from our Minister of Health or Minister of the Environment, et cetera, and help make the uh, case for it in as elegant uh, a way as we can? Thanks, Courtney. That's really, uh, that's really amazing that that um, person with that kind of knowledge is in that kind of position um, of influence and so heartening to hear. Um, for anybody who wants to watch change-making efforts and be a part of them. So thank you. Thank you both for your time, efforts, uh, presence, <laughs> uh, your, all of your work, and, of course, uh, your excellent responses to some pretty tough questions.